will hear two flatmates, Tom and Richard, discussing the rules of their shared house. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Richard, as we discussed before, with this extra bedroom in the house, we should advertise for another tenant. But I think we've got to establish rules this time. We already have two rules about the rent money. Remember, we pay on the fifth and expect full payment with no excuses. Sure, but I mean additional rules apart from those two. The rule is to pay rent money on the fifth, so fifth has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Richard, as we discussed before, with this extra bedroom in the house, we should advertise for another tenant. But I think we've got to establish rules this time. We already have two rules about the rent money. Remember, we pay on the fifth and expect full payment with no excuses. Sure, but I mean additional rules apart from those two. Okay, there's certainly no harm in that. Remember the problems we've had with people in the past. I think we should learn from those bad experiences. Y- you may have a point there. For example, you know that I like cooking, so I can propose a kitchen rule straight away. Every tenant must clean after use. We shouldn't allow what happened last time. You mean that guy who left all his dirty dishes piling up and food on the floor? Clean after use. We should write that down. I'm happy with that. And not only clean. But they also have to tidy up. We can't have them cluttering up our very small kitchen counter. I'm with you there. That will make life far more manageable. So tidy up is our second cooking rule, let's say. And now, can I tell you what really annoys me? Sure. Dirty tenants, those who just allow dirt and dust to build up around the house and don't care less. We've got to have a strict rule prohibiting that. What about a cleaning roster? We can make a list of everything that we expect to be done: carpets vacuumed, furniture dusted, toilet cleaned, and so on. And everyone is required to take turns. First my turn, then your turn, then the third tenant's turn. This spreads the load, so we can keep the apartment very clean. I'm happy with that. Otherwise, one person will be working harder than the others. But how often do we do it? Every day, twice a week, or once a week, or what? Every day. What do you think? Too often, I would say. Well, every three days then. I don't know. We're we're all busy with part-time jobs and study. I'd say that once a week is good enough. It's probably what most households do anyway. All right, all right. Let's run with that then. As long as we do clean regularly and well. Okay. Are there any other rules? What about music, loud TV, that sort of thing? I want absolute quiet at night because I go to bed early in order to get up early for my job. So why don't we say no noise after say eleven at night? Earlier than that, ten p.m. That's consistent with most rental properties, and no overnight visitors either. You're right. That caused a lot of problems when the last tenant brought his drinking buddies in for the night. So we prohibit late-night noise and overnight visitors as well. That sounds good to me. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Okay, Richard. If we want to advertise for an extra tenant for the third bedroom, there's a website with an online form here that we can fill out. That will speed things up. Good idea. In fact, let's do it now and get it over and done with. Sure. The first category here is gender. I guess that means we write male or female. I think I'd prefer a male. He'd fit in with us. One of the boys, something like that. Sure, but that might limit things, and I'd say a female might be just what this household needs. Why don't we say any and let fate decide? See who turns up and judge them as they come. Okay, I'll type any. So now we move on to job. What sort of job do you want them to have? 
To me, it doesn't matter. Doctor, lawyer, cleaner, as long as they have a job, of course. Unemployed tenants can be a problem. Just type in must have. You mean a job? Yes. Must. Okay, that's done. Now, how much should we ask them to pay? A hundred and eighty dollars would be about one third of the total rent.、Uh, I'm doing the maths now with a calculator. The figure would be closer to a hundred and seventy-three dollars fifty cents. Well, let's round that up to the nearest five. I'll type in a hundred and seventy-five dollars, and we can share the extra one dollar fifty. Done. Now, finally, when can we let the new tenant move in? Immediately, I'd say. The sooner, the better. Type in immediately. But I'm busy this week with my job, so I'm not in the mood to interview tenants right now. And anyway, we've had just you and me for so long. What does another couple of weeks matter? So, when would you like the tenant to move in then? One week from now, beginning of the month, March first. Later, give it another four days at least. March the fifth is better for me. Okay, I'll type that in. It should be fine. Any later than March the eighth, and I'll be too busy with my exams. And that's about it. Section two. You will hear a police officer giving a lecture to some overseas students about ways to minimise risk in public. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Hello, everyone. As new students having just arrived, it is important that you are conversant with some of the aspects of living safely here. Let me immediately say that, in contrast to the high crime rate in other cities, ours is very low. Nevertheless, there is some advice that would be considered prudent in even the safest of places. It is therefore in your interest to look at this map of the city and familiarise yourself with its areas. Some of which may not be as safe as others, particularly at night. A little research now, in this respect, will obviously help you a great deal. For this reason, we have provided a variety of brochures and information leaflets, which we encourage you to take and read. In addition, you should talk to people you know, to your homestay parents and teachers, and get a feel for the situation both in the neighbourhood where you live and the city at large. Now, you should know about the police presence in this city. There are local police stations in every suburb, but not all of these are open 24 hours a day. For that, you need a main station, of which there are many, and you should familiarise yourself as to the location of the one nearest to you. Moving on, many of you might like to go out at night, so you should also familiarise yourself with the public transport system. It could put you at risk if you are wandering around lost in the late hours of the night, particularly if you are a woman. Our city has a fairly good public transportation system, but not all of it operates necessarily to late hours. For this reason, you can avail yourself of the special late-night buses known as night birds, which operate along most major routes. Again, collect one of the brochures on the table here for the night bird timetables. Finally, if you do feel there is an emergency, you can dial triple zero. However, this does not take you through to a police station, but rather an operator. This operator will question you as to the nature of the problem and then send your call through to the relevant department. Police. Fire or ambulance, as the situation demands. This may take up valuable time, and for this reason, we suggest that you find the emergency number of the nearest main station to where you live. This will speed up the process should you need police services in the event of a serious problem. Having said all this, let me remind you once again that this is a very safe city, and we don't expect any problems to occur. Yet it always pays to be prepared. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. 
On the same subject as being prepared for problems, it is a fact that the police cannot cover every part of the city at all times of the day. Thus, it is advisable for you to take some precautions and be prepared for any problems which may occur. There are less safe areas which you may inadvertently find yourself in and, through no fault of your own, be faced with difficulties. In this respect, some people advise that women in particular carry mace or pepper spray, which can be sprayed into the eyes of an assailant. However, please be informed that these are illegal and consequently cannot be purchased, constituting, as they do, an attack weapon. On that same theme, any knives or small arms, while perhaps being legal in your country, are illegal here and must not be carried on your person. One thing you can carry, however, is a personal siren. In the advent of a problem, you just push a button and the siren will sound loudly, drawing such attention that any assailant almost invariably flees immediately from the scene. Moving on, you may wish to stay out late to have fun or see the sights of this city at night, and we do not necessarily discourage that. However, we do advise that you confine yourself to areas that have sufficient street lighting or illumination. In the course of your activities, you may well meet strangers, but if this happens under clearly lit areas, visible to everyone in the vicinity, statistics prove that in almost all cases, nothing will go wrong, particularly if you carry your siren. Above all, the greatest rule is simply to exercise discretion and intelligence when you go about your business. All the rules that I have given are simply based on this, and by following them all, your stay here will be both enjoyable and safe. You will hear two students, Frank and Nicole, discussing their survey results. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, Nicole. Did you interview the required 50 people? Yes, I have them all here. I had intended to talk to over 50, actually, but I could only talk to 46 in the end, all students from the university. It should be fine for our purposes, and it was interesting, actually, to hear what they said. I was hoping for 50 to make a round number. Better for statistical purposes, but 46 should be OK. I think so. What was interesting was that many of them were not happy with the staff here. Really? What proportion? Well, one quarter of them said the staff were OK, and another 10% said they were good, which together makes about a third. So basically, the rest of the people I interviewed weren't happy in this respect. So, what was the main cause of complaint? Well, it's rather mixed. A lot of the foreign students complained about the homestay accommodation and the attitude of the homestay officers when dealing with these issues. Most of the foreign students said this, actually, but the bulk of the mainstream students had concerns with the attitude of the teachers. It seems they feel the teachers don't care enough and facilities weren't that important, relatively speaking. I think the teachers here are OK. Don't you think so, Nicole? Personally, I'd say most of them are fine. But obviously, there are a few I'd say need to improve in their commitment to helping students. Oh, not many, though. Only about 10%, maybe. More, I'd say. At least one third. Wow, Nicole, that's a bit harsh. That many. I'd say 90% of the teachers here are fine. I think I definitely disagree there. Well, whatever the case, the university seems to have some problems. Who should we inform about these findings? The course convener. He runs our programme. Yeah, just a small programme. These problems are serious and university-wide. I think we should talk to the assistant dean, at least. Come on. We're just a couple of students. We can't go that high. It's like some cleaners wanting to talk to the CEO. We've got to follow the chain of command and start at the bottom. OK, the course convener it is. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. 
Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. So, Nicole, can you explain the technique you used for interviewing people? Every time I try interviewing, I seem to encounter problems, and yet you manage to interview so many people so quickly. What's the secret? It's really quite simple. Let me explain it all. The first step, and this is probably the most important point, is to select the position or the location where you're going to do the interviewing. It's got to be a good one. For me, it was the university cafeteria at lunchtime, where people would be relaxed, have time, be sitting down, and be more willing to speak. Ah, clever. But that leads to the next point. Everyone's in a hurry these days, so you've got to immediately confirm that they can, in fact, spare some moments to answer your questions. There's no point starting and then having them rush off in the middle of the interview. It just ruins everything. Yeah, that's happened to me a few times, actually. And then it's equally important to carefully outline why you want to talk to them in the first place. Some people might think you're a salesman or a busybody or some nutcase from a religious cult. They have to know the purpose and trust you. Now, part of that trust involves guaranteeing that the information will be kept in total confidence. And for that reason, I show how we don't take down names or any personal data. After that, you're ready to begin. But sometimes they're not won over or not ready to give you the time. In which case, you remind them about how their information can actually improve life for all students, and that they are actually serving the purposes of everyone by cooperating. Right. Make it seem like a noble cause. It is in a way, but the last step is not so noble at all. I just offer them a payback, usually a scratchy lottery ticket. If they promise to answer all the questions, everyone dreams of scratching one of those tickets and winning a million dollars. So that makes them do everything you want. Aha!、Uh-huh. Very clever. You will hear a lecturer discussing human resource management. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-three. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-three. Obviously, the people who work in companies need to be managed. Pay must be added up, hours clocked, and leave tallied. This is known as hard human resource management or hard HRM. This is because it is based on hard numbers, facts, and rules. That is an impersonal, calculative aspect. And again, there must be such an outlook with all its paper-based systems in order to carry out company tasks. But If there's a hard, there must be a soft, and it is this soft element of HRM that I'd like to consider now. Historically, it took a long while before the importance of this soft element was realised. Originally, for example, in Henry Ford's car-making factories, workers were regarded as unthinking tools who would mindlessly repeat the same task for eight hours a day. This attitude worked for a while. However, the Ford Motor Company faced the growing challenges of huge turnover, lack of motivation, declining quality of their product, and labor disputes. It eventually became clear that the original ethos about workers was wrong. It needed to take their human needs more into account. That leads us to the modern soft HRM model, where the staff or human resources. Are now considered one of the most important assets a company may have, an asset just as tangible as the factories, shops, and money in the bank, and something that needs to be managed in a soft way as well as hard. Before you hear the rest of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions thirty-four to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-four to forty. So. What is soft HRM? It basically involves three elements. One is motivating your staff. The second is making sure they stay with your company. That is reducing turnover. And remember, turnover costs money, diverts resources, disturbs the system, and you may be losing a lot of experience there in just one staff member. The third element is using the staff in the best way. 
in a way that gets the most out of them. All of these elements are closely related and sometimes overlap, but are still distinct enough to be considered separately. Now, let's talk about motivation first. Obviously, people will work harder if they feel good about being where they are. This means the company should let people know that they are significant, and you do that by emphasizing the higher purpose their job serves in society as a whole. And this sense of higher purpose will drive people onwards. So, for example, if the company makes paper, have a motivation session, letting them all understand the importance of paper to modern society, and it is important. Basically, Everything is important when you think about it, so make this fact clear to all. As for keeping staff, well, that also comes from motivation. But do you know the number one reason why people leave jobs? The answer: because they don't feel appreciated. So you need to make sure that they have this feeling. How? At its simplest, the boss can say thank you to the staff. You can remember their birthdays, bring out a cake. Celebrate milestones. Take them to a restaurant once in a while, and say thank you again. But more importantly, mean it sincerely. If this is going to work, sincerity is very important here. Well, we've motivated the staff and retained them with the company, so now we've got to use them optimally. This is often done by getting them to participate more in the key decisions. This has two advantages. One, the employees feel more in control of their destinies, helping again with motivation and retention. And two, the company tends to make better decisions. Remember, often it is the people closest to the customer who can really tell you the very best things about what works and what doesn't. The modern organization realizes that insight, knowledge, and clever innovation can come from. Anyone in the company, no matter how close or far from the decision-making process they may be.